I would like to introduce uh, one of my favorite speakers here at Summerfest, somebody that I have certainly learned a lot from, and you probably have and will too, and uh, he is the author of Pleasurable Kingdom, uh, Second Nature, uh, he is an expert in animal behavior at Humane uh, Society University, and without any further ado, speaking on Kindred, I believe, or Kindred, we'll find out, in Tooth and Claw, The Virtuous Face of Nature, please welcome Jonathan Balcom. It's great to see you all here. It's great to come back. This is my fifth year in a row. I know there's some people who've been coming since the 80s, so um, I'm outdone there. But is nature cruel or cool? <laughs> of course, she is both. But we do have a tendency to focus on the grimmer, the crueler side of nature. And we have some phrases you may have seen before. It's all about to eat or be eaten, the struggle for life. And life, nasty, brutish, and short. That's actually taken from Thomas Hobbes, uh, I think 17th, 18th century British philosopher, uh, famous for describing, in my mind, a bit infamous for describing nature as harsh, and life in general as harsh and cruel and brutish and nasty and short. And I'm not here to deny that life and nature does not have its challenges and that there are elements that fit that mold. Um, but I am here to make the case that it's, there's so much more to that and there's a, lot, there's a lot good going on out there. And I'm focusing on animal nature, wild nature, human society, one could talk about this dynamic as well. I will nevertheless mention connections between humans and other animals. I prefer to say other animals in this context because we, of course, are biologically animals ourselves. One of the reasons why we may have the impression or we're often given the impression that wild nature is a harsh, cruel place is, uh, I mean, filmmakers, nature documentarians have actually told me that their primary target demographic is males in their 20s. And males, of that, or de that demographic tends to favor conflict, violent confrontation and that sort of thing. So that tends to skew how we view wild nature. Also, I think it's a bit mollifying to us if we have this impression that it's so cruel and harsh out there, well, it's fine for me to go and eat meat and support slaughterhouses and some of the nasty things we do to animals. So I think there's that psychology at play as well. Have you heard this phrase, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world? Hands up if you've actually ever seen a dog eat a dog. <laughs> not, not many, actually, I don't see any hands. So right, just a little background on this famous phrase, nature read in tooth and claw, it's from a poem by Tennyson, 19th century. He lost his friend Arthur Henry Hallam, uh, was a college dorm mate at Cambridge University, he died of a brain hemorrhage in 1833. It was 16 years later before the poem came out, but it's, that phrase has been extracted from that poem, it's quite a famous phrase. And he was lamenting nature's cruel indifference, that it would take his young friend's life at such a tender age. And there have been a number of popularizers of the sort of violent, confrontational, competitive side of nature. Robert Ardrey in the 60s and 70s was very, wrote several popular books about this, sort of linking our own sort of confrontational, violent, competitive behavior with that of other animals. This is very clearly exemplified in this cover of this book. Richard Dawkins, an extremely influential and important book, The Selfish Gene, nevertheless uh, tends to reinforce this idea that we're ultimately selfish organisms uh, acting sort of at the beck and call of our genes. And Richard Dawkins, I love the guy, I really admire him, he's very important, uh, but he does really take a very grim view of wild nature in his books and what he says. And then one other example I want to give here, this quite famous book, Pulitzer Prize winning Guns, Germs and Steel by Gerald, Jared Diamond. Now this is all about how certain societies came to become the dominant ones and sort of things like colonialism where countries walked into other countries and essentially took over and decided, told them how to operate and enslave them and things like that and uh, the fates of human society. So certainly if you look at our own history, it tends to reflect this might makes right way of sort of thinking that if you have the power to do it, it's the right thing to do. And I think clearly if we reflect on it, we don't really agree with that way of thinking. But we have as a species, as a society in the past, and to some degree still today, acted according to that uh, dictum, if you like. So competition, predation, parasitism, I'm, parasitism, I'm not here to deny that they exist, uh, but there's uh, not a lot more to them. And these, we might call them plus minus relationships. One benefits, the predator gets the food, and one loses, the minus, the prey 
dies. Or the host in a parasite host relationship, there's a predator prey, and uh, there's a typical parasite uh, we're all familiar with, although there are many different kinds of species of mosquitoes. Now let me talk about some plus plus. I believe, and I haven't done the math, but I do believe that for every plus minus relationship there is out there in nature, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of plus plus mutually beneficial relationships in nature. I'm not the only one to think this. Uh, th th this book came out in 1902, so quite an early thinker about this idea. Peter Kropotkin, a Russian biologist, socialist, and this book has been having a bit of a revival in recent years. Mutual aid, and look what he wrote about how animals interact and the relationship between competitive type interactions and more cooperative and mutualistic type interactions. This kind of flies in the face of the sort of message we get from uh, nature documentaries. An important American ecologist, Paul Colombo, in his book, 1970, 1978 book, Why Big Fierce Animals Are Rare. I mean, I love that title. It really says the story. I've read this book. It's a great book. And uh, it's tough to be a predator. It's a dangerous lifestyle. You gotta chase your food. You gotta try and catch it. There's a reason why these, are much more common than these in nature. Even though they're both birds, they're about a similar size. It's because these guys eat grass, they eat low, low on the food chain, not just grass, but they eat low, relatively low on the food chain. And these guys have to find meat, although they are primarily scavengers. They all eat fishes at the shoreline and such. But uh, there's a reason why nature and e ecosystems can support far, few, far fewer predators than they can herbivores, far fewer meat eaters than herbivores. And that's simply that energy is lost at each level of a food chain. Huge amounts of energy. According to Colombo, about 98% of energy is lost by heat, by respiration. It's just lost to the environment. And it, I mean, energy is neither created nor destroyed. You may know that famous uh, law of thermodynamics, but it doesn't make it into the next level. Very little of it makes it into the next trophic level. And that is why bald eagles are extremely rare compared to, for instance, Canada geese, which by the way, whose biomass is a lot smaller than the vegetation that they feed on. And that's really a law of ecology. Another interesting recent book that kind of, this is even more recent, that speaks to a sort of a growing interest in the kinder side of nature, The Age of Empathy, one of Franz de Waal's books, a very popular writer, primatologist. And empathy is quite widespread in nature, certainly among mammals, monkeys, mice. Studies show that they have behavior that reflects a concern for others, usually of their own kind, in some cases only of their own, uh, uh, their, in their own social circle, but nonetheless empathy. So let me now go forward and describe a few concepts and some examples of virtuous nature, the virtuous side of nature. Here's an important concept, kin selection. It was only in the early 60s this term was coined. In fact, I played croquet with the guy who actually coined the term, John Maynard Smith. Uh, I beat him, I'm happy to say. Uh, I am competitive, unlike him. And um, I didn't literally beat him with the croquet mallet. I, I won the game, I just want to clarify that. I am a vegan and I try to live by those principles. Kin selection is simply the idea that it's not really that simple, but it's, a, it's based on sort of the whole genetic idea. The selfish gene actually was published later, but the idea that if you help others who have copies of your genes, meeting close relatives, kin, you are actually enhancing your inclusive fitness. There's your direct fitness, which is your own progeny. They clearly have a lot of copies of your genes, but by helping a few others um, who are close relatives, you may be improving their chances of their genes, which are similar to yours because they're related, showing up in the next generation. A nice illustration is the eusocial insects. The insects that are extremely social, they're highly, they're, they're much more ready to give up their lives to help another. This is termites, for instance, or ants are another example. They're much more ready to give up their lives for the colony than are other species who are not as closely related to each other. Because of their interesting genetic situation, only the queen lays the eggs. Workers are twice as closely related as we are to our own siblings. And that may help explain why they're more ready to give up their lives and they're very, very it's highly kin selected and they behave accordingly. So studies sh really do support this theory of kin selection. Parental investment is another manifestation of kin selection. Uh, a mother's baby has 
uh, at least half, about on average, half of the copies of her own genes, and she is very willing to invest highly in that. Of course, there are variations on that theme. Some parents in nature have huge numbers of offspring or propagules. I'm speaking not just of animals, but also plants. And uh, so the investment is not as high there, but they make up for it by making many, many copies. And birds also invest heavily in their young, and some other species as well, including some insects, not just vertebrates, but invertebrates. Altruism, the idea of if you're not related in kin, nevertheless, it may serve you to do good deeds to others. This particularly works in social settings. So if you're, if you're in a social setting and we recognize other individuals, if, if I do a good deed to Jim over here one day, Jim will remember that. He's a smart guy and he'll, he'll know that I'm a nice guy, I did him a good deed. Maybe I get a flat tire next week and he happens to be in the parking lot or I have a, a battery that died in my car. He'll help me because he'll, he'll remember the favor I did. So this is just a sort of uh, examples of how one good deed deserves another. And that's really the principle of altruism. And it fits the way animals behave. Uh, vampire bats, this is a vampire bat. The first empirical study to demonstrate this sort of reciprocal altruism was done by a biologist at the University of Maryland who spent several months in the enviable position of lying upside down looking up at a hollow tree where there are bats, vampire bats, um, defecating on his face and, <laughs> and he's uh, got this special light and uh, you know the things that ecologists will do to study this stuff but he found he marked individuals and vampire bats live in little colonial groups and they're unrelated they're non-kin it's usually one male with a harem it's a harem species and um, he noticed that females would feed blood to other females it's kind of gross to us but that's what they feed on they only have four teeth they've evolved to drink blood and you don't need teeth to chew blood they're specialists on blood and he noticed that they would regurgitate females would regurgitate blood for others to help feed them if the other was sick or giving birth or was for whatever reason unable to fly out and forage that night and he found that there was a higher likelihood of reciprocating that good deed um, later between the two individuals who'd shared. And he did the genetic test and showed they were not actually kin, so it wasn't kin selection, it was reciprocal altruism. Prairie dogs are an example of an animal who have a pretty complex alarm calling system. And if you think about alarm calling, this is to essentially sound the alarm that there's something dangerous. A hawk is flying towards the colony or there's been a black-footed ferret spotted or someone's out with their gun or there's with their dog. And this is a way that animals will warn, individuals will warn others. Well, if you think about it, making that call, that, that alarm call draws attention to yourself. So it's an altruistic behavior because you're taking a risk to help the group, to help the colony. Chickens do this. Many different animals have complex alarm call, calls for this, for this purpose. And it feels good to do a good deed. Uh, I, I sometimes rescue bees. After a heavy rain, I found this bumblebee on the sidewalk and I, I picked her up. They never sting you. And I uh, took it back to my kitchen and put a little um, sugar in some water, mix it up, put it on a Q-tip and offered it to her. And it's, the tongue comes out and it's like, wow. If I'm kind of putting myself in the bee, it's like in the place of the bee, it's like, oh, this is so nice. I'm enjoying this meal. And, you know, she essentially refueled her tanks and then I was able to take her outside. She was dry and warm by then and she flew off and it felt really good to me. And I suspect there's a lot of highly empathic people in this audience and you probably know that feeling. And that's kind of like nature's way of rewarding good behavior. It's a little squirt of endorphins out of our brains. It's like, just makes us feel good to do a good deed. And that's not just happenstance. That's because evolutionarily, it's a good strategy. It's not just that. I mean, it's also a cognitive experience we have. But nature rewards good behavior, and that's an example of that. So mutualism, another term that I think it's important to mention because it's the classic plus plus. It's both sides of the equation are benefiting, and that's a mutualism. And perhaps the most widespread mutualism is one of the most, ones, most mundane. We, we may overlook it because it's so everywhere, and that is the relationship between flowering plants and pollinators. It's an extremely successful. The great majority of the tens of thousands of plants in the world, species of plants, actually probably hundreds of thousands, are flowering plants. They're in the group that flower. They produce these big flags. It's a big signal. I'm ready. 
come and get me. It's like, it's beautiful, it's bright colors, lovely smells. And what do they do when the, when the animal gets there? The payoff is they get nectar from the, from the flower. They may also get dew dripping off it, but they also get nectar in there, and that's the reward. So, so what's happening? It's the plus plus, the, the pollinator gets the nectar, they get a treat, they get some nutrients, and the flower gets pollen moved from one place to another. And it's extremely diverse, the, the different types of pollinators and flowers. Some of them are very specific, some are more generalist. There are some, there are some orchids that are specialized for just one species of bee, for instance. In fact, just as an aside, and I didn't include this picture, some orchids actually have taken the nectar out of the equation. They simply offer sex in exchange for the pollen. They, they have flowers that look like um, attractive female bees. The male bee goes, lands on it, and essentially copulates with the flower, and in the process of all that jiggling around, he gets uh, pollen on him, and then he flies to another flower to have another go, being a male, and uh, that it moves the pollen around. So the, the, the uh, orchid, by imitating a female bee, can forego the personal expense of providing nectar. So it's an interesting dynamic. But it is a, a plus plus, it's a reward system. That one actually is questionable on whether it's plus plus, but I think if you ask the bee, they'd say, yeah, it was good, I enjoyed that, it was good. <laughs> Fruit is just another extension of that, the provision of fruit. This time it's getting seeds moved around because seeds that drop below the parent plant are gonna have to compete with the parent for light and nutrients and water. So it's much more beneficial from the plant's perspective if the seeds are moved far away, hence the evolution of fruit. Again, a plus plus. A nice color, uh, uh, so an attractant, nice smells. The cedar waxwing in this case comes in, eats the fruit, gets a big nutritional reward, so the cedar waxwing benefits. And then the cedar waxwing is going to fly away and defecate somewhere, and those seeds are going to be dropped on the ground in a convenient package of fertilizer. It's a very nice arrangement. Oxpeckers on mammals in Africa. The, the mutualism here is probably that the, um, the uh, in this case, impala gets parasites removed and maybe even a little back massage. Who knows if they like that. The oxpeckers get food because they pluck off um, the parasites and other things. They also serve as mutual alarm systems. They each have visual and hearing systems that are a little bit different from each other, so they may be picking up cues that the other doesn't pick up. So there's that benefit as well. There is a slight parasitic element to this relationship. Oxpeckers now have been noticed that they sometimes take a little bit of blood from these animals, and the, animal, the host doesn't seem to mind that too much, although I have, I have to admit, I have seen in Africa, I've seen them, them twitching and trying to get them off. So that one's a little borderline on whether it's always a plus-plus relationship. Interdependence is all part of this. A nice example is ants and aphids. Um, this is, uh, you may have seen this, when you see an aphids on plants, the aphids are feeding on the sap, and gardeners often don't like that, but there's often ants that are there running around among them. They actually tend them, they sort of farm them, although it's not factory farming, they don't put them in confinement in cages and such. Um, everybody seems to be happy with the arrangement. And what happens is the, the co-evolution is such that the aphids have evolved to release this little uh, sugary, sweet, clear nectar out of their rear ends. And uh, these little honeydew drops, and the ants love it. They eat that, and that's the sort of the payback. That's the payoff. So you're protecting us. The ants are very good protectors, and they will vigorously protect these aphid farms, and the aphids pay them by giving them some nectar. So I just want to say as an aside that I often see, I, I see very, a lot of cute butts here at this conference, but the sweetest butts of all are aphid butts. <laughs> Group living, it, it, tends to promote, it tends to promote this kind of goodness. Because if you live in a group, as I mentioned before, it behooves you to be nice to others. And so that's the, that's the basis for a lot of the plus-plus relationships in nature. I'm being a bit mammal-centric here, although I guess I've shown you some insects and some other animals. But um, certainly mammals offer some nice illustrations of this. These lions, these are young lions. And you can just see from this picture, it just exudes the feeling secure and good. I mean, they look a little nervous. They've seen something off there to the left, and look at them rubbing up against each other. It's sort of a sense of security. It makes them feel part of the group, and they feel good about that. I studied Mexican free-tailed bats for my graduate's research, and when they fly out of these caves, they fly in these big, tight columns. It's safety in numbers. That's one benefit of that. These are wood swallows from Australia, and I'm not sure if it's, they keep warm by doing this, but certainly keeping warm and comfortable is one of the reasons animals will congregate together. But it probably also provides some security. There's also a phenomenon called the information center, 
which is where individuals share information, such as elephants, they live a long time. Some of the older ones know where the marula trees are and when they fruit and where, where it is and when there's a, a place where there's a, a good a water hole and it may be 10 miles away and then they head off. And so the younger ones learn that information from the older ones. And that's another benefit of living in groups is the acquisition of knowledge and information. And friendships and just companionship. We look at a school of fish and we're prone to sort of concluding it's just willy-nilly. But in fact, fish like these wonderfully named diagonal banded sweet lips. So I've now talked about sweet butts and sweet lips in the same lecture. I'm quite proud of that. They actually have showmates. They have preferred individuals they like to hang out with. It's not just willy-nilly. Obviously, these huge giant schools of millions of herring, they don't know all of each other, but studies show that you get familiar schools and unfamiliar schools and fish prefer to swim with the familiar ones. So there is discrimination and a recognition going on there. And animals' communication systems relate to this. The fact dolphins and some birds so far have been now found to actually name each other. They have labels, so the individual names themselves, but others refer to them by their name. In this case, it would be sort of a whistle sound that they use. As far as I know, they don't use Nancy and Kyle. So pleasure is a great motivator, and, and pain, the flip side, is a discourager. So perhaps not surprising, over evolutionary time, you're going to see a, a decline in, in the painful type of interactions and an increase in the pleasure. Again, there are some that are necessary that have to happen for survival to occur, the predation and parasit parasitism, and competition does occur. But animals are encouraged to do things that are beneficial, and those things are, become rewarding through time. And the reward is the encouragement. I like to talk a little bit about the power of touch because it's something that's often overlooked and touch is, the more I research this, the more I realize just how widespread and important it is in nature. And it's also a positive thing, so it's very relevant to this topic. Touch is sort of a way of, of showing acceptance, showing affiliation, you know, I, I, I like you, I, I'm glad you're with me. It's a way of, to me, this, this sort of speaks to the reciprocal altruism, but uh, it's more than that. That's a bit, it's almost cynical to put it that way. It's also just being nice and feeling good together because it's not just the recipient of a massage who enjoys the massage. These are Arabian babblers. This is called allopreening, by the way. It means preening another. Very widespread in birds. In the case of horses, equids, zebras, they often have this position where they're each facing opposite directions and it's a way, and they'll nibble each other on the withers and so it feels good, but they also, it's thought to be a security thing. They're together, they can touch each other and the eyes are oriented in different directions so they can see more around them. It's a bit of a theory, no one's ever actually asked the horses this. And not surprisingly, we enjoy these kinds of interactions too, the soft feathers of the bird and the, if you've ever held a, a chicken in your hand and if they're trusting of you, and a lot of chickens are if they live on sanctuaries, they, they sort of start closing their eyes and they relax. It feels good to them. And we know that from cats. And pigs love a good belly rub as well. What about fish? Do they like belly rubs? I don't know if I like belly rubs, but they love to be, some fish love to be stroked. This is Larry, he's a Bahamian um, grouper, and uh, he hangs out at this area off the coast of Florida, and there's many other reefs where you can find these situations of individual fish who know the humans, and they probably recognize them as individuals, and they like to be touched. Well, why would they like to be touched? Well, there's this phenomenon, and I've talked about this before, cleaning stations where fishes line up to wait their turn to be serviced by other fishes, in this case, a map Puffer fish being serviced by a pair, a team of um, cleaner fishes, cleaner wrasses, blue striped cleaner wrasses. And um, how does it work? Well, it's plus plus. The fish gets a nice spa treatment and the cleaner wrasses get food because they're plucking off parasites and algae and sloughing skin and what, what have you. And sometimes other fishes will mimic the cleaners and will bite off more than they should shoot, more than they should. They'll take a nip of a fin and quickly swim away. So it's a bit Machiavellian and that's probably why other fish, and I'm not making this up, they actually watch these interactions and they form image scores as to how well these other fish are as cleaners, how reliable they are. So it's a pretty dynamic, complex, social and cognitive interaction. And this phenomenon spreads into other settings. So you have cases where hippos will spread their legs and splay their toes and open their mouths to have these cleaner fishes of various species pluck away at them. And the hippos sometimes drift off into, a, into sleep. They're so blissed out. And the fish get some food, so everybody benefits. 
There's areas of Western India where feral dogs team up with langurs and they hang out, to, out together. And um, it's probably a benefit by increased vigilance and also the dogs get massages and probably parasites removed from them as well to everybody's benefit except for the parasites. In parts of Africa, warthogs will flop down near where they know there's a colony of banded mongooses. The mongooses will swarm over them. It's a predator-prey interaction, but there's no predation going on here. Um, these mongooses are once again plucking bits of salt and parasites off the warthog. The warthog, I suspect, is not thinking about Darwinian fitness or parasite removal. The warthog is saying, this feels so good. I love this. <laughs> and the social emotions arise from this. Emotions such as the joy that we feel when we play, uh, the love we feel for individuals who share copies of our genes. Lust. Maybe curiosity. And celebration. It feels good to be nice. So in closing, nature isn't just um, an endless struggle for survival. There's so much more to nature than, than that. Like us, animals like hanging out together with their friends, <laughs> catching some rays, being ambitious, doing yoga, <laughs> and even tasting snowflakes. And so I encourage you to think of nature as so much more than a competitive struggle. There's so much beauty and goodness in nature and we need to celebrate that. And that relates very much, I think, to this conference where we celebrate striving towards a better interaction with, with animals and our own lives. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>